Thank you, Ada. Hi, everyone. I'm Vivek, one of the founders and CEO of HackerRank, the developer skills company. We started the company over a decade ago to make the world care more about skills over pedigree. Since then, we've been able to help over 24 million developers get jobs, partnered with over 2,500 customers to help them become skills-first organizations, and we're just getting started. When we work with our customers, we help them across four dimensions. We help them set up their skill strategy. We help them showcase their tech brand. We help them optimize their hiring process. And we help them mobilize their internal talent. While these four things are going to be true for a long time, maybe even eternal, the way that you're going to accomplish these is changing in today's world. And that's why we're adding a fifth dimension to help our customers embrace AI in accomplishing these. AI is on top of everyone's minds. Is AGI going to come? What is going to happen when AGI comes? Is it going to take over humanity? Is it going to take over my jobs? And these are very valid and interesting questions. But you know what? This isn't new. Here's an article that talks about how unemployment is being blamed on new machines. Devices displace workers hit prosperity claims. Any guesses on when this article was published? You can put them on the chat. Okay, I see 1800, 1850, 1920, 2000. Okay, very optimistic. This article was published in 1928. And in the same decade, in the 1920s, there was an even more ominous article that said, as practically no individual skill will be needed in a few years, we got to start working to develop our leisure skills, such as an interest in drama, music, photography, swimming, and others. And in the 1930s, as radio and TV became popular, there was an article that claimed that even the leisure skills were being taken over by machines. And by the way, these kind of proclamations were not done by laymen. Here is Professor Albert Einstein proclaiming or forecasting a doom of humanity and how machines are going to enslave all of us. And in the 1940s, we had a senator, a US senator, who wanted to levy a special tax for companies that used more of machine labor compared to human labor. I'm not kidding. This was a real discussion in the 40s. Thankfully, the bill didn't pass. The same story in the 60s, except this time on the cover of Time. The same story in the 80s. The same story in 2000s. And the same story now. Yet, we're all here. We are all alive. We haven't been enslaved by machines yet. So, we should be fine in the future. Right? Yes? No? Well, you may argue, no, this time it's different because the machines that we're building are really intelligent. So just because it didn't happen in the past doesn't mean you can extrapolate the future. And that is a fair argument. So what is going to happen in the future? Are machines going to enslave us? Or is this whole AI thing a fad and there might be some changes, just marginal? Or are we going to live in a whole different world that's going to benefit humanity? Well, let's explore together. Let's first start by understanding the adoption curves of the different technologies. Let's start with the internet. Started in the 90s, and this is the adoption curve. Then came smartphones, whose adoption curve is steeper than the internet. And then we have AI, 
whose adoption curve is steeper than smartphones. Of course, we're in the early innings. As you can see, the dotted lines is just a forecast or an extrapolation. Now, whether AI is going to follow that adoption curve or not is based on how much more intelligent and capable AI systems can get. And that is determined by three factors, data, algorithms, and compute. Let's take a look at each of them, starting with data. This is a picture of the inauguration ceremony of Pope in 2008. This is the same inauguration ceremony in 2013. Notice anything different? Well, the amount of data that we're consuming and uploading is exploding. Sorry, I didn't mean to create a limerick there. It just, it just happened. Pretty much the entire knowledge of humanity is digitized on web. And the data is only growing. So I don't think we're going to have any problem with the amount of training data. And in fact, even if we hit limits, we can always generate synthetic data. So data and training data is not going to be a problem. Let's go to the second factor, algorithms. We've been working on AI for quite some time. We started with simple rule-based heuristics in the 50s, which powered things like the ATM machines. And then we started to work on machine learning on text-based stuff which served as a foundation for technologies such as spam filters in your email. And then we had a big breakthrough where we went beyond text to images and videos that started the whole field of deep learning, where we were able to identify images and video. And that serves as the foundation for technologies such as face recognition and autonomous self-driving cars and other technologies that you see there. And then we had an even bigger breakthrough where we didn't just stop with identifying images and videos, we were able to generate images and videos. And of course, we all know where that helped. That helped in deep fakes. And today, with the advent of transformers and LLMs, AI is actually able to do really good reasoning. So just within a span of 70 years, We've gone from simple rule-based heuristics to AI systems that can actually do really good reasoning. So algorithms are also evolving. And finally, the third factor, compute. These models are very expensive to train. They use a lot of resources and require advanced chips. The metric for the supercomputers these models are being trained on is measured by what is called as flops, also known as floating point operations. And these models are trained on supercomputers that operate at a petaflop scale. And to give an idea of what operating at petaflops mean, imagine a billion people each holding a million calculators and performing some complex arithmetic together. That is one petaflop. That's the power of the supercomputers that these models are being trained on five years ago. Today, these models are being trained on supercomputers that operate at 10 billion petaflops. We've gone from one petaflop to 10 billion petaflops in just five years. And here's the crazy part. We're just getting started. So the compute is also getting more powerful. So net-net, we have lots of data, algorithms are getting better, and compute is getting more powerful. This means that AI systems are going to get more intelligent and more capable. 
And this means AI is likely going to follow that steep adoption curve that I shared in the earlier slide. So now that we've established that AI isn't a fad and that it's going to be steeper than smartphones, how is it going to change the world? Now, whenever we think about AI, we always associate a robotic form factor to it. I don't know whether it's because of the influence of movies. You know, we always think about it as R2-D2 in Star Wars, or Schwarzenegger in Terminator, or superstar Rajinigant in Chitti in Enderin, or Shah Rukh Khan in Rawan. No, I'm kidding. Nobody thinks of Rawan. Uh, sorry, SRK fans. But you get the idea. Like whenever we thought like, oh, AI is going to get more capable and more smart, we always had like a robotic thing. It's going to be this super powered humanoid. And so our natural assumption always led to, okay, the first kind of jobs that is going to get impacted or displaced is going to be one that has a lot of mechanical nature to it, like assembly line work or factory work. And then it will be cognitive and then it will be creative. And the folks who are watching this are predominantly what we would consider as knowledge workers who are mostly cognitive and creative. And so we thought, you know what, I'll see how this AI thing is going to impact the mechanical jobs and appropriately adjust. But interestingly, today it's happening in the reverse order. Today's AI is way more creative than it is mechanical. In fact, today, it is easier to train an AI agent to write better code than it is to train AI to fold a piece of t-shirt and put it in a closet, a chore that I hate and looks like the chore AI also hates. So if this is going to be the new pecking order and AI systems are going to get more intelligent and more smart, which means they're going to get more creative and more cognitive, well, how is it going to impact all of our all of us knowledge workers. But specifically, we are gathered here to talk about a specific type of knowledge workers called developers who are certainly creative and cognitive. So how is it going to impact developers? How is it going to change developers' jobs? Well, I'm here to tell you that it has already changed the job of a developer. Today, 76% of developers use an AI assistant to write code. This is from our recently released HackerRank's annual developer survey. And the most popular one among them is called GitHub Copilot, which is essentially an assistant next to an IDE. And as you're writing code, you can highlight and ask it to write, let's say, unit tests for this function. And the Copilot is just going to write a unit test. It's like having a super smart programmer next to you. In fact, GitHub did a research where they had two cohorts of people, one who did not have access to Copilot and another who had access to Copilot. Both these groups were tasked to write a web server in JavaScript. The cohort that did not have access to Copilot completed this task in 2 hours and 41 minutes. The cohort that had access to Copilot completed this task in just 1 hour and 11 minutes a stunning 55% improvement. And this was, by the way, statistically significant. Now, does this extend to all languages, all possible tasks? There's certainly a lot of nuances, but you get the drift. This is already changing a developer's job and is making them 2x more productive. And as AI is going to get more intelligent and more capable, Maybe developers are going to be 4x, maybe 10x more productive very, very soon. So if developers are going to be 10 times more productive, then naturally, we only need one-tenth of the developers, right? That would seem like a natural conclusion, unless, of course, if you looked at the progression of developer technologies. We started writing software in assembly language. And then we progressed to Fortran and COBOL. Then we had software in C and C++. Then today, the more modern languages are Python, Go, and Rust. 
And along the way, we had a lot of technology evolutions and breakthrough as well in the form of IDE, cloud, CICD, etc. And at every evolution, it allowed developers to work on higher and higher level of abstractions that made a developer more and more productive. So much so that I would argue that today's Python developer with all of the tech stack is 10 times or maybe 100 times more productive than the assembly language developer of the yesteryears. Yet, as the productivity of developers grew, counterintuitively, the number of developers also grew. In fact, it was continued to steepen that today we have over 100 million developers in the world. And AI is another technology evolution that's going to be part of a developer stack. And if developer productivity in the past is any indicator of what's going to happen to the number of developers, then AI is going to steepen this curve even further that I think we're not far off from a world where we're going to have a billion developers, a billion creators. Now, the developers of the future are not going to look like the developers of today. Today, a developer gathers requirements, architects the system, writes code, writes test cases, deploys the code, and maintains. This is also called as SDLC, or the Software Development Lifecycle. Tomorrow, a lot of these tasks are going to be done by AI agents. And so the job of a developer becomes more like an orchestrator of these AI agents to review code, to stitch together things, to build high-quality production apps. We started the presentation with a question of what is going to happen in the future. Are machines going to enslave us? Or is this AI thing a fad? Are we going to live in a whole different world that's going to benefit humanity? I'm reminded of a famous Japanese movie. It's called Rashomon. It's directed by the famous director Akira Kurosawa. He starts the movie with a question. He ends the movie with the same question. He shares a lot in between, but doesn't tell you the answer. In fact, even today, Nobody knows what Kurosawa's answer is. But I'm not Kurosawa, so I'm going to share my point of view. I think we're entering a future of abundance. A world of abundance where every one of us is going to have a personal concierge, a personal assistant, a personal tutor, a personal doctor, and things like that. And in a world where you're going to have a billion creators, that world of abundance is absolutely possible. And I can't wait to be part of that future very, very soon. So I think the future is going to be a whole different world, but one that's going to be hugely beneficial to humanity. So that is my vote. We've talked a lot about AI today. But I want to end with a note. Technologies come and go, but ethos remains forever. We started a company to make the world care more about skills over pedigree. And that is not going to change. In fact, we're going to use AI to amplify that. And I stand here in front of you, honored, grateful, thankful, and a lot of objectives that I can put in here, because it's not just us who are championing this. It's all of you who are championing to change the world to care more about skills over pedigree. And for that, I owe all of you a lot of gratitude. Thank you, everyone. That's it from me. Over to you, Ada.